Thanks so much for tuning into this message today. My name is Pastor Joey McLaughlin, and the heartbeat of Elevate City Church is to help people know Jesus, follow Jesus, and lead others to do the same. And we spend seasons focusing on those three ideas. And right now, we're in a follow season. We want to help you follow Jesus like never before, help you live in his ways and practice his teachings. And so in this next message, that's what you're going to discover, how to be a disciple who makes disciples for Jesus. If this message is inspiring for you, we would love it if you'd hit that subscribe button so you can get the most up-to-date Elevate City content. And you can also give in the link below to get this message in front of more people. My prayer is that you are inspired and challenged today. Be blessed. Uh, if you're new and we haven't met yet, my name is Joey, and I'm so pumped that you're here tonight as we start this new collection of talks on the book of Jonah. Let me hear you say Jonah. It's going to be awesome diving into this whale of a tale that you're going to soon find out is about so much more than a whale. But before we do uh, that, quick commercial. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but week after week after week, people are getting baptized at Elevate City. People are meeting Jesus at Elevate City. People are crossing from death to life at Elevate City. And I just want for you to know that that's special, that every church doesn't get to see that. And um, what God is doing in this community of faith is something that is real and that is changing people's lives. And so if you've got friends who don't know Jesus, like you need to get them here. You got family who doesn't know Jesus, you need to get them here. Like whatever it takes, break their knees, throw them in the back of your trunk, bring them to church, okay? All is fair in love and Jesus following, amen? And so whatever you gotta do, I want for you to get somebody here with you in this series to experience what God wants to say to them. I think that this series is gonna be really important um, for just where we're at right now as like faith in America, as, as we think about the church in America. I think that the story of Jonah is so pertinent to that. And so I just really want to challenge you and for you to feel a sense of obligation and opportunity to bring somebody with you to experience what God is doing here because I believe that it's possible that one of your friends or that somebody in your family or that somebody that you work with could be a Sunday away from hearing the gospel and from being in those baptism waters themselves. Amen. All right, so with that being said, um, we're gonna jump into the book of Jonah, but before we do, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for tonight. And Jesus, I praise you for uh, Sean taking a step to get baptized tonight. I bet if you told Tyler a year ago that he would have been baptized, he wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told him a year ago that he'd be baptizing somebody, he'd say you're crazy, but you are, in the, you, you are the God who is in the business of turning people's lives around. And I'm so glad that you do. I'm so glad that you've turned my life around, that you've turned around so many people's lives who are here tonight. And I believe that you're just getting started. I believe that there are some prodigals who you're gonna call back home, some people who are far from you who are gonna be invited close to you, some people whose stories are gonna get rerouted. And I pray it's not in the powerful and matchless name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Well, the uh, story of Jonah is about so much more than a whale as you will soon see. Um, by show of hands, how many of you are dog people in the house tonight? Like another word for that is just like Christian, okay? Um, <laughs> Um, I grew up being a dog person. How many of you by show of hands are cat people? Another word for that is like demonic, okay? Um, <laughs> you can exit the doors now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, we love you, sort of. Um, I grew up a dog person and uh, very early on in life, I loved dogs and had dogs. I, uh, I grew up with this dog named Marley and uh, we named him Marley before the movie Marley and Me. So our copyright infringement case is still pending, all right? Um, and he was a golden retriever. I grew up with golden retrievers. And uh, today, uh, my wife, uh, she grew up with poodles, which are like almost dogs, you know? And so when we, uh, when we got married, we compromised and we got a golden doodle. And uh, that golden doodle's name is uh, Ziggy. And uh, Ziggy is the coolest dog that you'll ever meet in your entire life. Uh, wow, uh, cheers for my dog. Like not my sermons, but my dog, okay? Uh, Ziggy is obedient, he can do tricks. He, uh, he can like dance and fetch and lay down and like get Kayla beers, okay? Um, I'm just kidding, the beers are for me, all right? But, uh, but he's an amazing, amazing dog. Coolest dog I've ever met is undoubtedly Ziggy, but the craziest dog I've ever met is the dog that my dad 
brought home from the pound when I was 10, okay? When I was 10 years old, my dad brought home a puppy named Max. And uh, what my dad didn't know is that this puppy uh, was a black lab Great Dane mix. And so flash forward a year later and Max is 135 pounds. Like most people walk their dogs, Max walked me, okay? Max looked like I should be riding him, not walking him, all right? And uh, Max also came with this added feature of running away, all right? Just all the time, this dog would run away. And so I'll never forget one day when uh, my best friend, Thomas Woods, who uh, lived right across the street from me, he came over to my house and he did one of those knock and enters. You know what I'm talking about? Like where you just knock on the door and then you open it. You can't do that in 2022. You'll wind up on the news. You know what I'm talking about? Um, but that's what he did. Thomas knocked on the door, opened the, uh, opened the door, and when he did, Max, like a bullet out of a gun, goes barreling out the front door of my house. And so what do I do? All 68 pounds of me goes running after this dog, chasing him down the street. And he is just gone, like a bullet out of the gun. And I'm just chasing this dog as fast as I can. Max was like, he was huge and he was also stupid, okay? And so like at one point while I'm running after this dog, he runs into a car. Like the car doesn't hit Max, Max hits the car. I'm not worried about the dog, I'm worried about the car, okay? Like did Max dent the car? Is there going to be like an insurance claim? Is Max at fault? Like how are we gonna settle this? Better get Geico, you know? Like I'm worried for the car. And so I'm just chasing after this dog. I'm running through front yards, I'm running up on people's porches, I'm running through sprinklers, like just the whole nine running after this dog. And I make it about halfway down the street that my neighborhood crush, Nicole Griffin lives on when something occurs to me. I ran out the door chasing Max in such a panic that I ran out the door wearing nothing but my underwear. Now, high school Joey would have seen this as not an obstacle, but an opportunity. You know what I'm talking about? But 10 year old Joey was wildly embarrassed. And so um, I hollered for Max a couple of times and said, hey buddy, come back. And then just determined that the embarrassment of the love of my life, seeing me in my whitey tighties was too much to handle. And so I went back home, right? I, grabbed a trash can lid, covered myself up, and I walked back home. And that day I learned the limit that I had to running after runaways. Let me ask you tonight, what do you think is God's limit to running after people who run from him? Like how far is he willing to go? How intensely will God chase after those who run from him. I don't know where you are in your faith in the room tonight. I don't know if maybe you've been following Jesus and it's started to get really difficult. What he's asked you to do is really difficult and you don't know if you can keep saying yes and keep stepping into what he is calling you to. And so you're thinking about running away or maybe it's not a question of whether or not you're halfway down the street, but you're straight up outside the neighborhood of Christianity altogether. You're living in a different zip code, speaking a different language, living a different life. God is nowhere to be found in your life. You're a million miles away from him. You look back in the rear view mirror of your life and you can't see him chasing you at all. He seems like he is nowhere to be found. Like if God was there, he must have given up a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, because you don't see any evidence of him chasing after you tonight. You feel like he probably got worn out, tired out, exhausted. And so he just packed up, took his trash can lid and walked back home to heaven. And you're just wondering, is it possible that I am the one who just got away? Is it possible that God could run after a lot of people, but I've got too much crazy in me. I've got too much wild in me and maybe God's given up on me. I want for you to know that if that's you and you're in the room tonight or you're watching online, then you picked a great day to be here because the story of Jonah is about so much more than the dangers of sea travel or whether or not God is a whale person. 
The story of Jonah is about a God who relentlessly runs after runaways. And the story of Jonah teaches us how to follow Jesus when our default position seems to be to run. My goal for this series is twofold. Number one, to introduce you to the God who relentlessly runs after runaways. And goal number two, to teach you how to follow Jesus when you'd rather just turn and run. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Jonah chapter one is where we're gonna be tonight. Jonah chapter one. Um, while you're turning there, I wanna tell you um, about a version Bible plan. Um, you should be able to scan something somewhere or head over to our website and um, click through to a version Bible plan on the book of Jonah that our discipleship team has put together for you. And it's gonna be an opportunity for you over the next four weeks to walk through the story of Jonah. I'm actually going to be a part of that plan. I'm going to be commenting and liking and dropping little nuggets of wisdom as we walk through it together. And um, I really cannot undersell for you the significance of spending time in God's word every single day. Like I believe, we believe that when we open the Bible, that God opens his mouth. And maybe one of your first steps back to God, if you feel like you've run away from God, is to be able to hear from God by opening up the word of God each and every day. And so I just wanna challenge you, just join that Jonah devotional and we're gonna walk through it for the next four weeks and just see what God has to say about people who run from him. With that being said, Jonah chapter one, we'll pick it up in verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and call out against it for the evil has come up before me. So as we see the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and I want for you to know tonight that the word of the Lord is still coming to people today. The question is never whether or not God is speaking. The question is always whether or not we are listening. Like how crazy is it? How crazy is it that the God who made everything spoke it into being wants to speak to you and me? Like that's insane. Do you know what's more insane is that you and I don't seem really interested in listening. Now that's another sermon for another day, but the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and Jonah is a prophet and a prophet is somebody who hears from God and speaks on behalf of God. And what God tells Jonah to do is to go to the city of Nineveh because Nineveh has found their way on God's radar. Nineveh has caught God's attention. Now, let me give you some context for the city of Nineveh, a little background on Nineveh. Nineveh is a great historical city that was founded in 6,000 BC by this guy named Nimrod, okay? His parents hated him clearly. And so they name him Nimrod and he was a great hunter warrior and he builds the city of Nineveh through war and violence. And Nineveh becomes one of the strongest cities in the ancient world. Nineveh would have been uh, located in a modern day Iraq, about 200 miles north of Baghdad, which tells us that spiritual strongholds can stay on people and places for generations, for generations. Also another story for another time. Nimrod builds the city of Nineveh through hunting and through warrior violence, and it grows into the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the most dominant force in the ancient world. And uh, what we see is that it grows to a massive population of about 120,000 people. And so this would be the city that's about the size of Athens, Georgia today. It's just a massive city for the ancient world. And um, the people of Nineveh are intense idol worshipers also a lot like Athens, Georgia is today, okay? <laughs> just full of idol worship all throughout this city. And um, we see just the barbaric violence of the Ninevites. Like the Ninevites were wicked, evil, cruel people. What they did is um, we see that they wanted to dominate their foreign adversaries through such intense fighting that they would skin their enemies alive and nail their tongues to the ground and leave them there to die. The um, leader of the Ninevite army wrote in a diary to himself celebrating how much he loved himself. Um, he said this about their barbaric war tactics. He said, I set their villages on fire and I watched them burn. 
I watched them burn until they were wiped from the face of the earth with their blood. I dyed the mountains red like wool and celebrated their destruction with feasting and dancing. And I built a pyramid out of the heads of the soldiers that reached to the sky higher than anyone else could see. So basically, if you were from here, you got straight out of Nineveh, just tatted on your back right here, just straight out of Nineveh. It was a horrible place. The kind of place of violence where you don't wanna take the kids to Nineveh. No one's going to Nineveh on a trip or on a vacation or on exploration. And so it makes perfect sense that when God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, he's like, I'm good. I'm good. Like, it would be like God saying to you or I, hey, how about you go to, I don't know, Iraq or Iran or Russia? Like, like how about you go and you take this story, you take this good news of the gospel to the Taliban? No, thanks, God. Find someone else. Like, it's so easy today to stand here all these years later and go, Jonah, what were you thinking running from God? You were just so silly running from God. Well, let God tell you that and see what happens in your life. But this is what happens is God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. And if God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, you best believe he's going to ask you and me to do some difficult things too. This is just part of it, that God asks his people to do difficult things, but Jonah doesn't respond. Jonah turns and runs. Verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Now, the book of Jonah has such humor and satire in it. And Hebrew humor is all about wordplay. And so you'll notice like the rhythm of the book of Jonah. There's all these poetic rhythmic schemes that are actually illustrating humor. So the, the Jonah chapter one says, um, the Lord said to Jonah, arise and go. And so Jonah arose and fled, right? It's like being comedic. It's almost going, it's so comical for him to rise and run away from God. Like, who does this guy think that he is? He can't run from God. That's what he does. He arises and he goes to Tarshish. Now, for some context, okay, Jonah is in a Joppa, all right? He's in Joppa. And, um, Nineveh is about 550 miles northeast of Joppa on a map. And uh, what Jonah does is he goes down to his local marina and he gets on a boat and he heads to Tarshish, which would be modern day Spain. At that time, it is the end of the known world to the west. It is 2,500 miles west in the opposite direction, okay? It would be like your boss, telling you like, hey bro, um, I need you to go to uh, Washington DC, which is 600 miles away because there's somebody up there who I need you to fire. And you being like, nah, I think I'm gonna book a flight to Seattle, 2,600 miles away in the opposite direction and go visit the local Starbucks instead. Like Jonah is not like lost. Jonah didn't get confused. It's not like he was using the demonic Waze app and is now just having to reroute, okay? That's not what's happening here. There's no rerouting that is needed. Jonah is running. He is 2,500 miles away from what God has called him to do, which should tell us today that disobedience is always harder than obedience. Disobedience is always more difficult than obedience obedience, 2,500 miles more difficult than obedience. Isn't it interesting today that some of us are working harder to not do the thing that God has called us to do than it would be to just do that thing in the first place? Some of us are like exhausting ourselves, trying to avoid the call that God has placed upon our lives. We're trying to play mental gymnastics in our mind and convince ourselves that it's not that big of a deal and that it's really not that necessary. And so we're actually creating all this extra work for ourselves, inventing ways to go to Tarshish in 2022. Like some of you, uh, God has placed a call for ministry on your life. He's called you to pastor but you were so afraid that that meant that you had to take a vow of poverty that now you are finishing up your uh, like second uh, doctorate degree in finance um, all so that you didn't have to take that vow of poverty of becoming a pastor. And um, now you'll be spending the rest of your life paying off those student loans. You're welcome. 
we work harder to run away from God than it would be to actually just be obedient in the first place. Like some of us, like with reading our Bibles, like we know we're supposed to read our Bibles, but we think that it's difficult to understand. It's going to be a lot of work if I got to like sit down, create time for it, like have a quiet time, get a moleskin journal, brew a cup of coffee, like get some pens, like get the music just right. Like that's going to take so much work and so much time. And it's weird to understand. There's weird languages and where do I even start? And so, you know what? The Bible's just really confusing. And I don't even know that I have to read the Bible to be a Christian. And actually, you know, there's a lot of like contradictions in there. And I don't even know like if it's like really necessary. And we spend so much time talking ourselves into how difficult it is that if we just spent that same time doing it and figuring it out in the first place, then we would already be done. So much more difficult to walk in disobedience than obedience always, always. We might not get on a boat and go to Tarshish, but we most certainly run, which leads to a great question today. Where are you running? What are you running from? What is the difficult thing that God has called you to that you are moving away from? Like, is it a hard conversation? Is it confessing a secret sin? Is it getting marriage counseling? Is it sharing the gospel with somebody? Is it inviting a friend or a family member to church? Is it talking to somebody in your life who's got like a sickness, like an illness, and like the time is running short, and you don't know where they stand in their relationship with the Lord, and you know that it's gonna be awkward, but you know you're the only one God has put in their life to really have that conversation about what happens when they cross over the threshold of this life, and they step into eternity, and you know you need to say something, and it's been eating you alive, and it's been keeping you up at night, but it's going to be difficult because you know they're probably going to reject you and they're not going to be really open to it. And so you keep avoiding it and you won't even go see them and you won't even call them and you won't even check on them because you know it's going to be so difficult. What is it? What is the thing that you know in your life God has been calling you to move towards, but you have, been, but you have just gone to Tarshish instead? Is it maybe mentoring somebody for the first time and you're going, I don't even know if I have anything to offer or I don't even know if I have any time to give. I am just drowning in chores and kids and responsibility and I know that I'm supposed to be making disciples and I know I'm supposed to be investing and I know I'm supposed to be teaching somebody the truth of God's word, but I've just got all these excuses in my mind and so I'm just gonna go to Tarshish instead. Is it adoption? Is it foster care? Is it reconciling a relationship? Is it starting to give financially for the first time? Is it sowing in sacrificially? Is it addressing is it addressing bad culture in a workplace that you've just allowed to exist and your boss did it and their boss's boss did it and so you're just going with the flow, continuing with that toxic culture? What is it? Because this is what I know is that God uses his people to do difficult things to bring life to dark places. But life isn't going to get into dark places unless we stop getting on ships and going to Tarshish instead. I would go so far as to say that if there is not something right now in your life that you can identify with relative quick like, like relatively quickly um, in your life, that difficult thing that God has called you to do, it is not because he's not calling, it's because you're not listening. God is always, like, just because there is a call in your life that is hard, it does not mean that it's from him. He is always calling his people to step into bolder waters, into deeper faith, into deeper conviction. It, it's, it's never getting easier as you walk with Jesus. This thing is about more faith. This thing is about more sacrifice. This thing is about more obedience. So often we settle for Tarshish. You see what Tarshish is? Tarshish was a, um, it was a well-known port and a fishing city in the day. It was a quintessential coastal town. And so it's a place that people would go for fishing and for other recreational activities and for the food. And so Tarshish symbolizes comfort. And a lot of times we crucify our call on the altar of our comfort. We sell out on walking in this call of God using us to bring redemption and reconciliation and hope and peace and the kingdom of God to our lives and to our businesses and to our neighborhoods and to our families because we would rather settle for comfort instead. You know that it says that he paid the fare. Don't miss that part. 
Do not miss the fact that Jonah paid the fare. Now, if you, um, if you look at the language here, then what it says is that um, the idea is that he didn't just pay the fare for himself, but he paid the fare for the whole crew on board. That homie literally charters a boat to go in the opposite direction. This would have cost him like a life savings to be able to pay for a ship with a crew and with a captain to take him the distance from Joppa to Tarshish. And so I want for you to know tonight that running from God is extremely costly. It is costing you time and mental energy and likely money that you're sacrificing on the altar of comfort that is never going to lead you into your call. It is costing you. It is so, so costly. And you cannot miss this part tonight. There will always be a boat. There will always be a boat. When God calls you, invites you to step into doing something, to step into your destiny, to bring about change in this world. There's always going to be a boat that will just take you to Tarshish instead. Do not be surprised when it happens. I want for you to know that it is no coincidence tonight, fellas, that as soon as you start taking your relationship with the Lord seriously, and as soon as you start taking purity seriously, and as soon as you start taking guarding your eyes seriously, that that girl slides up in your DMs. It is no surprise. Her name isn't Tiffany. Her name is Tarshish, okay? <laughs> and Brittany was right. She is toxic too, okay? <laughs> There's always going to be a boat. I'm trying to be pure, trying to walk with God, trying to be a man after his own heart. And here comes Tarshish sliding up in my DMs. It's the way that it works. Every time that you want to walk with God, there is going to be someone or something that comes along and that acts as a boat to take you away from what God has called you to. There will always be a boat. You'll want to walk with them and sell out to living a life of generosity. But then that next career option will come knocking. You, you, you want to live a life where you're not living above your means and you're stretched and you've got no margin for generosity or for sowing into the kingdom. But then that second home comes knocking time after time the boat shows up at the docks which is the reason that if you want to follow Jesus when you'd rather run away as followers of Jesus sometimes we just got to burn the ships we got to learn to burn the boats I don't know if you're familiar with this phrase or not I got really excited about it but maybe you don't know the origin of it and uh, the origin of burn the boats or burn the ships you'll hear coaches or leaders or um, entrepreneurs say this phrase sometimes, you just got to burn the ships, you just got to burn the boats. And it has an extremely interesting origin. It comes from when, um, when the Aztec empire was being conquested by Cortez, by Hernan Cortez in 1519. And what he did is he wanted to go and to dominate all of the gold that was in the Aztec empire. And so he set sail on ships with his men and went there. And when he got there, once they made their way a sea and they pulled off all of their supplies, he ordered that his men drench the boats in fuel and set them ablaze, set the ships on fire because it made a statement to his men that day that we were either going to be victorious or we were going to die trying, but we were not turning back. Three years later, Cortez had conquered the entire Aztec empire because he burned the boats. And if we want to be people who follow Jesus when it's difficult, we've got to burn the boats when it's not. Because if you won't burn the boats in your life right now that you know have a tendency of taking you to Tarshish, then I promise you, you'll get aboard the first one when difficulty comes knocking. You got some boats you need to burn in your life so that you can follow Jesus and not allow this world to take you away. But I want for you to notice tonight that Jonah isn't just running from difficult things. Jonah isn't just running from hard things. Jonah isn't just running from Nineveh. Jonah is running from God. Jonah chapter one, verse three, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. 
it has become extremely obvious to me that we as humans have this propensity to run. We run. We run from God. It's been happening since Adam and Eve first sinned in the Garden of Eden. And when God came walking in, they ran away and hid in the bushes. And you and I have been running ever since. Sometimes we run because we feel shame just like Adam and Eve did. Sometimes we run because we feel fear just like Abraham did. Sometimes we run because we get caught up in worldliness just like Noah did. Sometimes we run because we're greedy just like Ananias and Sapphira. Sometimes we run because we're embarrassed just like Peter. And sometimes we run because we tragically misunderstand the grace of God just like Jonah. But we run. Man, do we run. And I know that there are people in the room tonight who are probably at so many different places in their running from God. Some people tonight, they're like, I'm Usain Bolt, okay? I'm Usain Bolt. I am running from God. I'm running hard. I'm running fast. I'm running aggressively. I am looking for every opportunity to not be at church on Sunday. I am exploring every new wave of theology out there on the internet. I'm trying stuff I've never tried on Friday nights. I'm going places I've never gone, doing things I've never done. I am looking for a way out. I am running from God. You say in bolt level. And then others of you, you would say like, okay, I'm not like Usain Bolt level running from God. I'm like Jonah Hill level running from God, okay? Like, I don't know if you know Jonah Hill or not. It doesn't look like his 40 time is real impressive. You know what I'm saying? And it's maybe not a sprint, but it is certainly a slow drift. Like being at church isn't a issue of obedience. It's an issue of convenience. It's not like I'm, looking for a reason to not be there, but if something better comes up, I might take that instead. And like praying and like Bible study and like community and discipleship, those things are seen as something that you like, oh, you should do, but not something that you will fight for. You see, it's like a slow drift. What begins to happen is we start to like live in some sin, but then just call it a season. Whew. We live in sin, but we say it's just a season, right? I'm just doing my 20s right now, okay? It's just like a midlife crisis. I'm just out here looking for me, all right? And really what's happening is you're living in sin, you called it a season, and next thing you know, you're starting to question if you believe any of this in the first place. And you're going, is the Old Testament like even real? And like, do we know that this can be trusted? And I mean, there are a lot of other like paths to heaven, right? Like God surely can't be the only way. And like, I, I don't know, like, you know what? I'm just deconstructing right now. And all of the sudden, what was just supposed to be a season becomes your identity and who you are. And you're running from God. We run in so many different ways. We run by trying to create distance between us and God. We run by um, trying to say that the busyness of our life is just a season or that we're just playing COVID catch up or we'll do these mental gymnastics where we'll like make excuses that make us feel better about ourselves. But the truth is possibly that you know it, deep parts of your soul, but what's happening is you're running. You're running and maybe you didn't even realize it. Maybe you didn't even recognize it. Maybe Tarshish just looked appetizing and appealing and you didn't mean to run away from Nineveh or maybe you did, but tonight something could really happen if you realize that running from God is just silly child's play that never goes good for any of us in the end. Running from God is silly child's play that never goes good for us for any of us in the end. You see, sometimes what we do is we act like because maybe we stop doing Christian things or we stop showing up for church that somehow like God can't see us anymore. <laughs> like we, we think sometimes, I think they're like, we've outsmarted God. Like, oh, he won't know where I am. He won't know what I'm doing. It's child's play. It reminds me so much of like what happened with my kids when they first started to understand discipline. 
particularly Raleigh, okay? Raleigh, like, she got to this point where she started to understand, like, early on, maybe she was, like, I don't know, a year and a half, two years old, and, like, whenever dad would go to discipline her, because a father disciplines the children who he loves, Hebrews, check it, um, and so I would go to discipline her, and so maybe I'd raise my voice, or, you know, her and her mom would be having a disagreement, and I would, uh, come around the corner and she would know that dad was there to have a hard conversation with her. And so do you know what Raleigh would do? Is Raleigh would put her hands in front of her face because she knew that if she put her hands in front of her face that she couldn't see dad. And she thought that if she couldn't see dad that dad couldn't see her, right? This is object permanence people. It's like parenting 101, all right? It's the reason that they're fascinated when you go, they thought you were gone, okay? <laughs> and it's silly, but don't we do the same thing with God? We act like because we get a little physical distance from us that he can't see what's really going on in our heart. But God searches the heart, knows the heart, and he knows those of us who run from him. We try so hard to turn down the dial on his voice, but I want for you to know tonight that God holds the remote control and he will not allow his voice to be deafened in your life. It's what we see in the story of Jonah. It's the great grace of Jonah. Jonah chapter one, verse four, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. Don't lose sight tonight of the fact that God sent the storm. God sent the storm. You see, so often storms happen in our life and we just get so mad at God, so frustrated with God. Like, God, how could you inconvenience me like this? Why would you send this to me? Why would you do this to me? And we perceive, we view the storms in our life as God trying to destroy us when oftentimes it's the storms in our life that God is using to redeem us. God is using this storm not just to discipline Jonah. Yes, is that there? But he's using this storm to get Jonah back to his heart. Could it be that the storms in your life are God's great grace to you? Could it be God's great grace to you that you didn't get that promotion? Could it be God's great grace to you that that girl walked out on you? Could it be God's great grace to you that he didn't let you step into that season? Could all of that that's swirling around you and that's opening your eyes to your need for him be his great grace to you? We gotta shift how we see the storm tonight. We gotta start thanking God for the storm and asking in the midst of the storm, hey, have I gotten off course? Have I gotten off track? Have I misstepped? Have I run away? And is this God trying to pull me back? God sends the storm, not to break Jonah, but to pull Jonah back on course. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Now, I love that. That language is so interesting. It is the only time in the entire Bible that we see the effects of someone running from God start to have its manifestation, starts to have its effect on a boat, on, on like just an object. The, the boat feels Jonah running from God. And the running from God is so intense that the boat's like, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Like, I don't think this is a good path for us. The boat is like, I'm about to fall apart if you don't turn your face back to God. The boat threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. So what we always try to do in the middle of the storm, we're like, okay, we gotta get some stuff out of our life. We gotta move things out of our life. We gotta slow down. We're gonna canceling this practice and I'm canceling this credit card and I'm not going to that gym anymore and I'm not hanging out with this friend and Tuesday night that activity's gotta go. And we start to throw things out of our life to lighten the load when the storms begin to come. But what I've noticed happens first in modern day Christianity that a lot of people do in the chaos and the hecticness of life is they tap out on church. They tap out on community. They tap out on service. They let go of the very thing that would bring them the most life. Please, please, please tonight, when you find your life swirling and you find the storm surrounding you, yeah, please, 
pull your kids out of sports for a season and please quit that second job and please downgrade and get a home that you can actually afford. Please do all those things. Please evaluate and lighten your load, but do not lighten your load on the thing that will actually save your life. Too often I've seen it happen. Like there are families who've been a part of our church and it breaks my heart, but you know, they're attending and they're serving and they're part of the dream team and they're all in. And I get it, man. Church plant world is hard and it is difficult and it is a sacrifice. But then they stop serving and then they stop attending. And then we, you know, we try to sit down and have a conversation. They're like, yeah, my marriage is just in turmoil. And my kids are acting crazy and everything at work is just insane. And like, it wasn't like this six months ago. And I'm going, that's about when you stop coming to church, brother. And could it be, could you just see that maybe there is this interconnectedness to all of this chaos and the decisions about what we've cho chosen to let go of? Don't let go of the thing that brings you life when you're trying to lighten your load. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid it down and was fast asleep. I don't want for you to miss that part either. When you're reading the Bible, this is just a quick discipleship moment. I always want for you to be asking yourself, where's Jesus like, where is Jesus? And in this moment, like I see Jonah goes down in the ship in the middle of the storm and I immediately think about Jesus on the boat with his disciples when there was a storm and Jesus is down in the boat sleeping just like Jonah was, right? The similarity is that they're sleeping in a boat in the middle of the storm. The difference between Jonah and Jesus is that Jonah is sleeping because he's exhausted. Jesus is sleeping because he's in control. Jonah is sleeping in the middle of the boat because he is tired and exhausted and he's afraid and he's scared. And so he's in the storm asleep. Jesus, the greater Jonah, who doesn't run away from his calling, but runs towards his calling is sleeping because he's not afraid because he knows that his God's gonna pull him out of the grave. Jesus is the greater Jonah. Always be looking for jo Jesus as you're reading through the Bible. So this is what happened. So the captain came to him, Jonah, and said, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. This is modern day rolling the dice. These sailors, they try to figure out what has happened. They try to figure out what has gone on. They try to figure out who's responsible for this action and they can't find it amongst them. And so they go down and they find Jonah sleeping because he's exhausted from running from God. And I need you to know tonight that if you are exhausted in your soul, it could be because you're running from God. Have you ever had one of those days where all you wanted to do was pull the cover over your head in bed and act like the world just disappeared around you. Act like there was no job or kids or responsibilities. Just the weight and the pressure of it all was too much and you just wanted to escape. That's where Jonah is right now. Because that's exactly what running from God feels like. It taxes you and it takes from you and empties your soul. So these men go down and to Jonah and they're, they're looking for an answer and they're wondering, how can you sleep at a time like this? How in the midst of everything that you see that's going on, would you be able to sleep at a time like this? How did you get here? Don't we wonder that sometimes? How did I get here? How did I get so far away from God? How did I get in such bad rhythms? How did I get such bad habits? How did I get these addictions? How did I get this identity? How did I get these friendships? How did I get this depression? How did I get this anxiety? How did I get this worry? How did I get this worldly? How did I get this arrogant? How did I get this preoccupied with the things of this world? How did I get here? How did I get caught up in this much lust? How did I get caught up in this many lies? How did I start faking it this way so often? How did I get here? Let me tell you how you got there. One sin at a time. One sin at a time. One going to Tarshish when I was supposed to go to Nineveh at a time. One left when I was supposed to go right. One, I'll do it later. One, I'll do it next week. One, I'll do it tomorrow at a time. Uh, I could tell you stories about pastors who I know who've planted churches and been successful and man, they ended up having affairs 
and they wrecked their church and they wrecked their families and they wrecked everything. And when you sit down with them and you ask them, man, how did you get here? They didn't just walk out the doors of the church one day, do black tar heroin, and then the rest was history. It's not the way that it happens. It's, I stopped reading my Bible one Monday morning and I never picked it back up again. And then I stopped believing in the power of prayer. And then I let defeat get the best of me. And the next thing you knew it, I was isolated and alone and searching for something to bring me comfort because nothing else felt like it could. One sin at a time is what gets Jonah to this place. And so they're going, how are you here? How are you sleeping in the midst of this storm? Are you crazy? He's not crazy. He's just broken. He's just exhausted. He's just at the end of himself. And so... Then they say to him, what shall we do to you? Because they realize that, um, that jo- they, they cast lots and the lot falls on Jonah. And um, so look, look at verse eight. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is it that that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, these mariners very likely had a polytheistic understanding of God. They believed that there were many gods, that there was like a God of love and there was a God of war and there was a God of earth and there was a God of the land and there was a God of the sea. And so when Jonah says, I worship the Lord of heaven and earth, I'm a Hebrew and he is the God of the wind, the waves, the land and the sea, they're going, what are you thinking, bro? Your God is the God of the sea and you ran away from him by getting on a boat upon that sea. Have you lost your mind? What are you thinking? And Jonah goes, listen, I'm a Hebrew. I'm like, I worship this God. Like it's it's a really interesting response. And if you look at it in the original language, there is this tone of repetition, repetition of almost regurgitation. What Jonah is saying is like, yeah, I'm responsible for it. I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. I've said this thing since I was a kid and I, 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 I kind of figured this was gonna happen. I kind of thought that I was gonna get in this place. This is kind of what he does. This is kind of who he is. I ran from him. My life is a wreck. It's falling apart. And so it's my fault. Sorry about it. And in this moment, because it takes so long for Jonah to actually get to a point of repentance and brokenness, he's in this place where he knows what he should do, but he doesn't believe it yet in his soul. He knows, yes, I'm a Hebrew. Yes, I worship the Lord and the God of heaven and earth and the sea and all of it. And like he could stop all of this. And, you know, I kind of thought that this was going to happen, but. uh. And so they go, well, what should we do? What should we do? Could you like talk to him? Could you like call him or like send a dove or anything? Because we would like for this to stop. And he goes, ah, pff, throw, me, throw me into the sea. Just like hurl me, hurl me over the ship. The same way that God hurled the wind at you guys. Just hurl me back there. He'll make it all calm down and it'll be fine. They don't really like that option if you notice. They said to him, uh, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Tempestuous, that's my second favorite word in the whole Bible, just so you know, tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea that the sea may quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Which you need to know today that running from God will oftentimes heap problems on the people around you. Like don't get aboard somebody else's ship just because they want to be captain. It's guaranteed to have storms. When you're surrounded by somebody who's running from God, that storm is going to affect you. And I want for you to know that your running today is affecting others. Like your spouse is depressed because you're running from God. Your mom is heartbroken because you're running from God. Your dad is in debt up to his eyeballs to pay for rehab because of your running from God. Do you see that you're running from God? It's never just about you. It has this way of affecting everybody around you. Nevertheless, the men rode back, rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out 
to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, it's crazy what Jonah does here. He has an option to tell them exactly what he's done and to say, all right, guys, I'm coming clean. I'm a Hebrew. I love the Lord. He told me to go to Nineveh. I went to Tarshish instead. So let's just turn the boat around. Just turn her around and let's head back that way. Take me to Joppa. I'll catch a camel to Nineveh and we'll be good. But that's not what he does. He's at a point of such paralyzing destruction in his soul that he would rather die than do what God says. Hurl me into the sea. How blind do we get when we begin to run? How illogical do we get when we begin to run? We get to this place of, of just being at the bottom in our souls that we would just rather be thrown into the bottom of the sea instead of doing what God's told us to do. This is what will happen when you let disobedience reign king in your life. This is what will happen when you continue to run and you continue to, to put distance between you and God. It just wreaks havoc on your soul. And it's, it's really funny to me, some of the games that we play in church. Like, Joey, you don't know how far I've run. I could never turn back to God. I've run so far away from him. I've done so many things. Oh, really? Have you run... 2,500 miles in the opposite direction? Have you taken your entire life savings and paid for a fare and a crew and a ship to take you in an opposite direction? Did you sleep through a storm, a hurricane-like storm that God sent to your life where lots casted like the roll of the dice, like the lottery was run to prove that it was you who was running from God? And then when you woke up and you knew what you could do, you just said, I, I would rather die than do what God told me to do. Have you run that far? Because if God will run after Jonah in this, God will run after you wherever you're at tonight. I love what God does here. Famous part of the story, Jonah chapter one, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God provides a way back. One of the things that I've loved to do with my kids um, is play hide and go seek with them. I love playing hide and go seek with my kids and especially Raleigh when she, uh, she was growing up in the house that we had, it was just so fun to play hide and go seek with her. And um, you know, it's, it's an interesting game when you're playing with a two year old, right? Because you're like sort of a sociopath if you don't want them to find you, you know what I'm talking about? Like when I play hide and go seek with Raleigh, like my goal is like for her to find me. Like when I'm playing hide and go seek with Raleigh, I'm not, I'm not like up in the attic, tucked in there in camouflage, getting off my, like getting so excited that my two-year-old like can't find me. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not like, oh, she will never find me. I'm the greatest hider of all time. That's the last thing that I'm doing. I'm like hiding behind the corner of the room that she's in, like kicking the wall, right? Just like, I'm like taking blocks and throwing them out in the, in the hallway, like, oh, where's daddy? Where could he be? I'm literally throwing flares and signifiers to try to get her pointed in my direction. That's exactly what God is doing with you and me. It's exactly what God is doing in the story of Jonah. He's sending wind and seas and a great big fish. He's rolling, casting lots and rolling the dice and pointing all the arrows in Jonah's direction to go, hey, I'm here, you can come back home. So this great fish swallows up Jonah. It takes him into the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And I know that that sounds crazy and almost impossible to believe, but not as impossible as what God has done to chase after you. He sent his son, Jesus, not to be in the belly of a fish, but to be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights to get you back home to the heart of God. Let me show you Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 12, we'll close with this tonight. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you, but he answered them. 
An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Listen, you may be far. You may be far from God tonight. You may feel like you are addicted and like you're a liar. You may feel like you are a thief. You may be full of rage and anger. You may have been in a relationship with a married man. You may have tried to convince your girlfriend to get an abortion. You may be just on the edge of feeling like your life is getting ready to be tossed into the sea itself. But I want for you to know that God has orchestrated your steps, that he's situated providentially things in your life to get you right here to this moment, to be hearing a sermon about a God who runs after runaways to get you back home to his heart. 2000 years ago, he sent his son Jesus on the greatest rescue mission that there has ever been. And just like Jonah was cast into the belly of the whale, Jesus went into the earth to show you there is no place that he won't run and chase after you. How far is God willing to go? How far are you? Because wherever you're at tonight, he's chasing you down, he's seeking you out and he's inviting you back home. The first step of the runaway is always to turn back towards God. It's always to acknowledge who he is and acknowledge who you are and acknowledge what your life is without him. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, I know that there are people all over the religious spectrum, people who are following hard after Jesus and people who are trying, but it's really difficult and people who've been running away. Wherever you're at tonight, I just wanna give you an opportunity to surrender to acknowledge that your life is gonna be a mess without him and to acknowledge that he's been chasing you down every step of the way. Life isn't gonna work without him. Purpose can't be found without him. Satisfaction is impossible without him. Salvation is an impossibility if you don't know him. So if you just know in your heart of hearts that that's you, that you've been running from God, I just wanna tell you that there's absolutely a God and that he is so good and that he has so much good for you. He loves you more than you could imagine. He's got a life for you bigger than you could dream. There's a massive problem and it's your sin. It's my sin. It's called this chasm. It's caused this gap. It's caused these storms in our life. But there is hope. God sent his son Jesus to rescue you and to save you, to scoop you up when you were at your lowest and to carry you to where you're supposed to be. And there is a response, it's surrender. It's saying, yes, I'm tired of running and I wanna stop running from God and I wanna run to God. And if that's you tonight, it's not complex. It's not rocket science. It's not super sophisticated, it's simple. We've got a simple gospel, a simple story. It's just saying this, it's saying, God, I need you. Wherever you are tonight, if you know you've run from him, just pray that prayer, God, I need you. I need you to forgive my sin. I need you to be my savior. I believe you rose again and I wanna rise to a new life with you. If you're a runaway in the house tonight or watching online and you prayed that prayer, you said, I'm coming back home to the heart of God. I'm tired of running. I wanna get back to what he has for me. Then with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just wanna take a moment to mark this moment. And so on the count of three, I'm going to, I'm gonna count to three and I'm just gonna invite you to raise your hand as a sign of surrender tonight that you're done running and you're ready to come back home to the heart of the Father. One. Two, three. Yeah, come on, amen, amen, amen. Can we make some noise for the people who have run away from God, but that are running back to the heart of God tonight? Jesus, we love you. 
And as we study the book of Jonah, I pray that you would move in our hearts to stop running from you, to start running towards you. You know where we've been, you know what we've done and none of that scares you away. You love us exactly where we are, but too much to keep us there. God, remind us of your great love tonight. You are the God who runs after runaways. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.